Welcome to LifePoint Church. We are so happy you could join us again. If you are new, welcome to the family. Let's worship.
I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing.
does a lot like the end So used to losing, you're afraid to try again Right now all you see are ashes where there was a flame The truth is that you're not forgotten Cause grace knows you Father, thank you so much for everything that you do in our lives on a daily basis, even when we don't even see it, and even though there's times that we just rely on ourselves and rely on other people, and we don't realize that it's actually you that's working in our lives, that's making changes in our lives, that's making us stronger, that's making us better believers, better followers. We appreciate everything that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Life Point Church, family and friends, we're so glad that you're here with us today. If you're new, we would love for you to text hello to the number on the screen and let us know that you're here. There's also a button below for request prayer. If you click that button, a member from our church will join you for a moment of confidential prayer. Thank you for being here and enjoy the service.
I have never had my identity stolen. However, I've had the misfortune of having quite a few credit cards compromised so that I had to start all over and get a new credit card. Probably the biggest thing I've ever had to deal with, was, well, I should say the, the thing that was the most aggravating was when a bunch of spammers got a hold of my cell phone number and began calling people trying to get them to buy things. I, I would then get a lot of phone calls from people saying, hey, will you please quit calling me? And I would tell them, well, I never called you. But it happened over and over again. It became such a problem that I had to call the phone company. I said, well, this is what's happening. Can you do something to help me? And they said, nope, there's not a thing we can do. We need to cancel your phone number and you need to get a new one. That's no fun. I've never had my identity stolen. I can only imagine how rough it would be. But I can tell you there have been moments in which I got confused about my identity. And we, there are moments in which we lose our identity in terms of how God feels about us. We've been in a series of messages the last couple of weeks where we've been looking at the fact that we have these natural God-given longings. We have a longing to be loved. We want to have somebody that really thanks the world of us and loves us. We want to know our purpose. We want to know that, you know, what are we here for? I mean, it, I don't want to just live and die and not make a difference. We, we want our lives to matter. So we go sometimes into pursuit of understanding what our purpose is. And we also want to know answers to, que to the why questions. I mean, why, why, is life, why is life like this? Why is it so hard sometimes? In our search for love and purpose and meaning, sometimes what we'll do is we'll walk away from, well, we'll walk away from what the Bible teaches us, what God has to say to us, and we'll just go on our own search where we think the answer is not there, and so we'll just, well, we just go looking everywhere else. And in the process of doing that, we can make some decisions that, well, that we regret. We can hurt ourselves and hurt others and experience pain that we never thought we would experience. And we can come to the place of regret. Sometimes when we come to that place of regret, all we do is kind of have that moment of regret. And then after a little bit, we return to doing the same thing. We get into this kind of a little cycle of regret, repeat, regret, repeat. But then sometimes, hopefully sooner rather than later... We come to our senses, and we want to start over. And we realize that we, we need to do something different. We can't keep doing the same thing and experience something different. And then the God of this universe somehow gets our attention, and we turn our thoughts back to Jesus, and we go home. Or we begin to ask questions. We want to... We want to have answers, and so we, we come and we begin to seek answers, or we begin, we begin to uh, return to the God that we once walked with, but we begin to follow Jesus again. Now, here's the interesting thing about it, though. Even when a Christian who kind of went to the far land returns and they reconnect with Jesus, their life is still a mess. They're not instantly transformed into a mess-free person. It's a slow process that God begins to work in our, in our lives. When you become a Christian, when you trust Jesus for forgiveness and give him leadership of your life, you don't suddenly just have no more problems. You don't suddenly become some perfect version of yourself. And when you're a Christian and you begin to, to walk with Jesus, you're, you're, you're not walking around perfect. You're, you're still a mess. And God still is slowly working in you to bring about this positive life change which you so desperately desperately need in the process of doing all of this we can sometimes focus on the mess that we still struggle with and we can lose our identity that's one of the reasons that Jesus told the story the story we've been looking at for the last two weeks and we won't look at it again we want to look at a section of it that I think is going to have a profound impact on you and how you think about yourself. The story is the famous story of the prodigal son. 
Jesus was telling this story, and he, and he said, a man had two sons, and one of the sons, the younger son, was so upset with him and so down on his own family and the way they thought and the way they lived. And he had these longings we were talking about for love and purpose and meaning. And he thought the answer was somewhere else. And so he left his father. And he, before he left, he asked his father for his inheritance. His father, even though he was very much alive and very healthy and the son didn't deserve it, he gave it to him. So the son went to the far country and he just blew the money. Just wild living, went through the money in a hurry. And a famine hit that land. And suddenly that son found himself without money, without friends, in a foreign land. And he was desperate. He finally found a job feeding pigs. And one day he came to his senses as he was feeding the pigs. And he, he was so hungry. He looked at the slop that these pigs were eating. And he, he thought, I, I think I want to eat it. When he thought, he, and then, ah, he came to his senses and he thought, my father and all the people that work for him, they have all the food that they could possibly want. I just, I've, I've, I've done so badly. He had this huge moment of regret and wanted to change. And he made the decision that he was going to go back to his father. And what he did is he said this to himself. He said, I want to go back to my father. And here's what I'm going to tell my father when he got back. And in fact, this is, this is what he told his father when he got back. As he was walking up to his father, and his father was running toward him. And he finally got to his father. His father grabbed him and hugged him and kissed him. And this is what came out of the mouth of the son. The thing that he had thought about to say, the thing that he had rehearsed a hundred times, he said this. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. In his mind, he had lost his identity as a son. He had this, as he walked back, he had this incredible shame that he felt, this, sense, this gigantic sense of failure. He, he, he was defeated. He didn't feel like a son. He had unbelievable shame. What did his father do? But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And at, that, at which point the son was going, Wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, I'm thinking I'm fixed, to, I'm fixed to get an earful. I'm fixing to be just, you know, read the riot act. I, it's, and he's talking about giving me a new robe and, and a ring and sandals. I mean, the robe. I mean, as he's sitting here thinking about this robe, he's thinking, he looked at himself and he, and he was just a mess. His, his clothes were damaged. He didn't even have shoes on. He had no sandals on. He had no ring. He had long since hocked that. And so he was just, no, he looked horrible. And he began to think about what this meant. I mean, the robe, gosh, he thought, it's going to feel so good to have that robe on. It's like, I don't, I don't have to worry about clothes anymore. I don't have to worry about food anymore. I mean, he's given me the ring. That ring is a, is a position thing. It's, it shows people that I'm part of the family. And I'm, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm in I'm still a son. He still loves me. He wants me. I mean, he's, he's in shock. A robe, a ring, and then the sandals. I mean, it just, it's just like everything is back to normal. But no, not really in the sense that he still was struggling inside with his identity. But he was trying to come to grips with what was happening at that moment. How he was being accepted and loved by his father is like... In his wildest imagination, he could not have imagined that his father would have accepted him that way. And why did Jesus tell this story? It's because Jesus is God in human form. He was, he was God speaking to us, telling us that he loves us and he wants to forgive us. He wants to restore our broken relationship. Now, before all that can happen, we do have to come to the place where we realize that we've done wrong. 
We have sinned. We, we have failed. We have gone to a far country. We've, we've turned from God's ways to do things that we shouldn't do. We've sinned and we need forgiveness. But when we come with the attitude like the son came in the sense that he came repentant, that he, he was sorry about what he had done and he wanted to begin again. When we come to Jesus, realizing what, that we have done wrong, and we want forgiveness, and we want to begin again. We want to trust him to forgive us for our sin. We do begin again. Now, you have to get to the place where you realize you have a need before you can accept the gift. I do things that are wrong every day. How about you? Let's assume you just do one thing a day wrong. That's just one. You say something you shouldn't say. You do something you shouldn't do, whatever it might be. In a year's time, 365. You live 70 years, 70 times 365, that's over 25,000. That's over 25,000 things you've done wrong. If you were hauled before a county judge and the judge said, read the charges against you. And the guy said, well, judge, there are over 25,000 violations this guy has or this gal has. You'd be in trouble. You see, we're in more trouble than we realize. And but the, but the God of this universe and telling that story says this, that when we turn back, when we have the repentant attitude, when we're sorry for our sin and we want to begin again, we want to have forgiveness, the God of this universe runs to us, hugs us and kisses us, wants to put a new robe on us, a new way of looking, a new way of living the ring that says that we're part of the family and new sandals and fixes us up, meets the, meets the needs of our life. The Bible goes on in other places to talk about this. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this. This means for the person who belongs to Christ. In other words, the person who's trusted Jesus for forgiveness has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Now, wait a minute. Is that true? I mean, seriously, is that true? You become a new person, it's like, okay, I'm sinless. No, that's not what it means. It means a, a, a new transformation is begun. The Holy Spirit has come to live inside you and will slowly begin the process of bringing about positive life change in you. It's a, you do become a new person, but that doesn't mean you become sinless or perfect not it's not that's not what it means but what it does mean is there's a change in fact once you trust Jesus for forgiveness and you try to go back to the far country and well it's just not the same you won't enjoy it like you did before because you the Holy Spirit's inside of you pointing out hey what you're doing it's not right it's not it's not good for you and we'll try to love you back into a right relationship with God and with others so a new life has begun not finished, but begun. It's the beginning of a relationship with Jesus that will last throughout eternity. It's the beginning of a relationship that will slowly bring about positive life change in you. In Ephesians, what, here's what we read. We read that God is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. You are forgiven. When you trust Jesus for forgiveness, you are forgiven. Not because you've earned it, you didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it. He bought it for us. He paid the penalty for our sin for us and forgives us. And because of that, it goes on in the same chapter, uh, chapter 8 of Romans, and say, now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Once you trust Jesus for forgiveness, you're no longer under condemnation, you're forgiven. It's incredible. I mean, to think about this, the God of this universe forgives you. He loves you. He pursues you. He begins to work in your life. It's just amazing. And so what we have a tendency to think sometimes is after we, uh, we do something and we mess up, we think, oh, gosh, I've blown it. it. You know, we do something and we think, oh, man, why did I do that? Same chapter, verse 39 says this. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. That includes your own sin. That includes when you fail. Why is that? 
In Galatians, it says, for we are all children of God. When we trust Jesus for forgiveness, we become his child. Not, not everybody in the world is a child of God. But we become his children of God, how? Through faith in Christ Jesus, in the Messiah Jesus. When we trust Jesus for forgiveness and give him leadership of our life, he, <laughs> he forgives us. He adopts us into his family. He loves us. So anytime you feel something that makes you think you're not accepted, you need to push back on anything that tells you that you're not accepted and loved by the Heavenly Father. Now, the great, here's great news. Great news. When you come to understand that, when you come to understand that truth, it'll change how you think and how you feel. When you change how you think and how you feel, it'll affect how you act. In, those, uh, in the way you act will affect your very character. It's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, isn't that just an incredible thing to think about? So here's the thing. We need to stop with this self-talk where we just beat ourselves up. When we sin, when we do something wrong as a believer... What we need to do is admit what we did was wrong and turn back to the Father and realize that when we turn back to the Father, we can find forgiveness. So we need to stop just saying, I don't deserve it. Now, that's true. Now, wait a minute now. You're saying it's true. Yes, you, but don't stop there. Don't say, I don't deserve to be part of the family. Don't stop there. Say, I don't, but I'm forgiven, and I am part of the family, and God loves me, and God's at work in my life, and God has forgiven me, and I can, and I can begin again. Here's what Jesus went on to say in that story. He said, the father says, to kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. I don't know if you realize it, but what... What the God of this universe is basically saying to you is this. When you turn back to him, you set off a celebration in heaven. You are celebrated. Every time you walk away and you walk back, there's a celebration. There's joy in heaven when you return. Now, in terms of celebrating here, here's what, we, here's what I think. I think when you first become a Christian, we have what we call a baptism celebration. What does that mean? Well, you, you become a Christian when you trust Jesus for forgiveness and you give him leadership of your life. As we said already, that doesn't make you perfect. That makes you forgiven. And God begins to work in your life. And one of the things that God wants you to do is to go public with it. He wants you to say, tell other people, hey, I've trusted Jesus. I've begun this journey with Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus from now on. And Jesus says, one of the first things I want you to do is to let other people know. I want you to be baptized. Now, the purpose of baptism is not to make you right with God. It's just simply an act of obedience that he asked you to do, where you identify with him, where you get into the water, and when you're submerged, it's like your sins are washed away. It's like a symbolic thing. You're, you've died to an old way of living. You've come alive to a new way of living. And so you begin the Christian life. Now, here's the really sad thing. You, can, you start off with this baptism, baptismal celebration, and you begin walking with Jesus, but sometimes we make a mess of things. Sometimes we take a detour, and we, well, we head in the wrong direction for a while. But God's Spirit will work on us to bring us back and to have us begin again, not become a Christian again, but to turn back to Jesus for forgiveness and make Jesus the leader of our life again and begin to follow him more closely. So what do you do? Well, if you're a believer and you walked away, God loves you. He wants you to return. His spirit is working on you right now to draw you back. He wants you to come back like the son that walked away. He wants you to come back repentant, admitting that what you did was wrong, turning to the Father. And when you turn to the Father, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find that he loves you. He runs to you. He hugs you. He kisses you. He forgives you. He helps to bring about positive life change in you. Because the Bible tells us this. 
But it says the thief's purpose, and he was referring to about Satan in this. The, th- the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. Cause all the damage he can. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. God wants you to have a great life here. That doesn't mean you won't have a difficult life. It doesn't mean you won't have problems. But what he talking about is that you'll have a rich and satisfying life as you have a you walk in relation to Jesus you experience positive life change you begin to find the purpose in your life of, of helping other people helping them with their lives helping them connect with Jesus it's just it's incredible I mean this I don't know what about you but I mean it's a you come alive you, you feel alive I don't know what kind of things make you feel alive maybe when you made the team Maybe when you graduated from school or co- high school or college. Maybe when you got married, had a baby, got the job. I can tell you the thing that's given me more joy and more, more satisfaction than anything else. It's when I trusted Jesus for forgiveness and gave him leadership in my life and began to follow Jesus. And he began to use me. I mean, sometimes I just sit around and scratch my head and say, me? I can't believe it. But I'm so grateful that God will use me, and he wants to use you. And you'll, the, the incredible joy that you're going to experience when you do that is, is it's just mind-blowing. I remember reading about uh, something that sometimes it seems so obvious to me. Have you ever noticed that sometimes they do studies uh, on, you know, in universities and they come back with conclusions that are so obvious, but now they got a study that says it's true? Well, anyway, a guy by the name of, Edward Hallowell, a psychiatrist at, uh, and a medical person at the Harvard Medical School, did a study, and, he, and at the end of the study, he came to the conclusion that the things that really matter in our life, the things that give us great joy in life, is accomplishing something. Makes sense, right? Accomplishing something, reaching a goal, and, and relationships that are rich, connecting with other people. Now, nothing is better than connecting relationally with a God of this universe who loves you and then connecting with other members of his church, especially when you begin to join part, like a, be part of a life group and where you get to be known and to know other people and to, you get invested in each other's lives. You study the Bible together and you pray together and you serve together. It, life it just becomes so incredibly rich as God begins to use you in the lives of other people, even in that group. The Christian life is a great adventure. It's, it's wonderful. Is it easy? Nah, it's impossible. It, only the Holy Spirit can help you live it. But when, the Holy, when you learn to let the Holy Spirit help you live the Christian life, it's rich. It's satisfying. You're going to love it. And the God of this universe wants a relationship with you, wants to use your life to make a difference. I don't know what I could tell you that, that, that would convince you if you're on the, on the, you know, right, you're right on the edge of trusting Jesus for forgiveness and giving him leadership of your life. I don't know what it would take, but whatever it is, I wish I could do it because it's, it's so incredible to be forgiven. I never will forget the moment when I trusted Jesus for forgiveness, to have that sense of being forgiven and starting again. And then each day as I approach each day, I, it's like I deal with my stuff, I deal with my sin, and I start over with Jesus, and I experience a rich and satisfying life because of it. So I want to invite you to that. And for those of you that are believers, I, that have walked away, that have detoured, that got, got your priorities mixed up, come back. Admit where you sin. Make Jesus the leader of your life again. And let him begin to work in the mess that's your life, just like he's working in the mess that's my life. God, I just thank you that you love us and you're at work in our lives. Even at this moment, those that are not yet believers, I know you're try- your, your spirit is tugging on them to help them come to where they place their faith in Jesus for forgiveness and give Jesus leadership of their life. I pray that you'd help them at this moment just as, to cross that line of faith and to pray, dear Jesus, I don't get it all, but I get this much. I've sinned and I'm sorry. And I'm asking you to forgive me and be the leader of my life. I don't understand it all, but I pray that you'd help me to understand it more. But as much as I know how, I want to follow you from now on. 
And Father, for all the Christians, I pray that you'd help them to once again make Jesus the leader of their lives, to deal with any sin that they dealt with. That I pray that you'd help them to confess their sin and even go to others if they've wronged them and admit that they did wrong. Now help them to begin again. Help them to trust you to help them to live the Christian life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.